change us today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, choir, praise team, orchestra, Brother John. Thank you for that good worship this morning. Thank you for being here. I know Snowmageddon was difficult to deal with. And uh, so thank you for being here. I know we threw you a curve with the hour change, but uh, if you'd have been over here late yesterday evening and saw our parking lot, you'd understand why. Uh, so we thank the Lord for everything and everybody getting here safely and soundly. I want to say thank you to all of you that made Night to Shine such an awesome, awesome night uh, this past Friday night, just to see all of the families that we were able to minister to, the parents, the, the kids. It was just an incredible thing. So thank you uh, to all of those folks who made that possible. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, I just want to continue to say thank you for all of you who are participating in our yearly focus this year. Uh, we're calling it m, &M Ministry and Missions, and we want to see everybody at Hopewell find their gift and get involved in a ministry that God has for you here. And then we want to see everyone go on a mission trip. And part of that, we've asked everyone uh, to take a spiritual gifts test. Several of you have done that and turned those in. Many of you have said that uh, you've done it, but you've not brought it back. We'd ask you uh, to continue to do that. And uh, so if you still haven't finished yours, would you please finish it and make sure uh, that it gets back to your Sunday school teacher or back to Brother Kenneth. And we're looking forward to seeing what God's going to do with that. And one other announcement, I told you last week uh, that the week before that we had more folks in Sunday school than we'd had in over two years. And so Brother Kenneth wants you to know that this past Sunday, last Sunday, we had more in Sunday school than we've had in three years. And so thank you for being a part. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, thank you for being a part. Keep coming. Keep being a part of that. Now, if you have your Bibles, would you open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13? And we're starting in verse number 6. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse number 6. I brought you a message last week entitled, Love, the Super Spiritual Indicator. And I'm bringing you the original title this week, Love, the Super Spiritual Indicator, Part 2. And that was simply because I couldn't get through all of the attributes of love. Y'all wouldn't have wanted to sit for two hours last week. Okay? And so we're, we broke it up, and we're continuing in this study. Now, I want to remind you where we are in this process. We started in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're working our way verse by verse through this as we look at Paul dealing with the church on the issue of gifts. And there had been those in Corinth who had essentially decided that their gift was more important than other people's gifts. They'd puffed themselves up and they had decided, I am a super spiritual person because I have this gift. And in most part, in Corinth, it would have been some kind of showy gift where you would have done something that everybody could have observed. It wasn't the behind-the-scenes gifts. And so they were saying, man, my gift's so important. And look at this. And especially in Corinth, it was the gift of speaking in tongues. And so Paul is dealing with all of that. And one of the things that he started out with, he said, all the gifts are necessary and needful. God has given all the gifts the way that he wants them to be so that the church has everything she needs to accomplish the mission and ministry. Now, I know some of y'all have been here through this whole thing. You're going, yeah, yeah, get to the point. We know this. But some of you haven't. And even if you you have, we got to say it because it's the railroad track to keep us on track. And so Paul had come to the place where he said, no, the super spiritual indicator is not gifts. And that's the beginning of chapter 13 and those great verses. Even if I were able to speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm but a, a, a clanging symbol. And then he goes on and he lists more. And he says, if I have the faith so that I can move all mountains and he lists all these other gifts and he says, but I have not love, I'm nothing. In other words, he was making the point that love is the super spiritual indicator. If you look at a person and are trying to discern, are they a spiritually mature person? It's not their gifting you're looking at, it's their love. And that's what Paul is laying down, and he begins to walk through what love really looks like. And of course, it's agape love, it's God's love, and that reason for that is because you and I, who've been bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit in us, this same Spirit that gives us spiritual gifts, is at work in our life to produce the nature of Christ, which is going to demonstrate the love of God to a world who needs to see it. 
And so we talked about those verses last week when we started uh, in those first few verses, verse 4 and 5 last week. We pick up in verse 6. He's still talking about love. And it says, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And so as Paul is concluding these verses on love, there's three things that he speaks to them and to us about. And I want us to kind of walk through those three things this morning. So he starts out in verse 6 and we see love's great contrast. Love's great contrast. In verse 6, he lays out this contrast, and he says, on the one hand, I want you to understand, love does not, that means it never rejoices in iniquity, but on the other hand, it always rejoices in the truth. And this is love's great contrast. But I want us to walk through it so that we grasp this at the depth that Paul is laying it out. The Greek word there in verse 6 for iniquity means unrighteousness. It means evil or wrongdoing. And so basically Paul says, I want you to understand that that the love of God does not rejoice in iniquity. The, The saints of God who are motivated by the love of God should never rejoice over unrighteousness or evil or wrongdoing. And most of us would say, well, of course, Scott, we know that God's against sin. He doesn't want sin in my life, and and he, he would never be happy if I'm living in a path of unrighteousness, but but please understand, Paul is talking to those people who say that they're super spiritual, and those people in Corinth who thought they were super spiritual and were puffing themselves up with pride, they were lifting themselves up, and I told you that whenever you lift yourself up, you're pushing others down, right? And what Paul is trying to say, if you're such a super spiritual person, please tell me, You've created such division in the church, and, and, and you, you are, you're putting your brother down to the point that you're going where you're not spiritual, and they're finding every fault with those other than themselves. You with me? And so when Paul says, listen, the real spiritual person doesn't go around rejoicing with iniquity, not just your own, but others either. Now, I'm not talking about Phariseeism that's always trying to point out the faults of other. Oliver B. Green said it this way, love finds no joy in the wrongdoing of others. It has no satisfaction in sin, regardless of who the sinner may be. Let's be honest. There, there, there are times if we're not careful in our life when somebody gets caught, when somebody blows it, that we almost are happy to see it because we knew it. I knew they were like that. And that's what Paul is warning against here. He says, no, real Christian love never rejoices over the hardship or heartache or the fall of anyone. Dr. Tom Constable in his great lecture on this passage said this quote, and I want you to hear him carefully. Love absolutely rejects the most pernicious form of rejoicing over evil gossiping about the misdeeds of others. It is not gladdened when someone else falls. Love stands on the side of the gospel and looks for mercy and justice for all, including those with whom we disagree. Can I give you a quote that you might want to write down because the Lord gave it to me, not because I'm saying it. Dr. Constable said that this love stands against the most pernicious form of rejoicing over other sins, gossip. It is not the heart of a spiritual person that is anxious to condemn. That is the heart of a Pharisee. That is the heart of a self-righteous man. A self-righteous man will condemn others' faults in order to feel better about himself. He will will condemn in order to raise himself up. And 
That is exactly what he's talking about. By the way, this is why gossip is not a little sin, but gossip is a great sin in the Scripture because in gossiping we are talking about and tearing down one who is made in the image of God himself. We are not on their side for their good. Or we are talking about them and rejoicing in their failures because in so doing we can puff self up and feel better than they are. No, see what Paul is saying, it is not super spiritual to look down on others or to run others down for real love never rejoices. Even if you say, well, I'm not really gossiping, I'm just telling the truth. But love never rejoices even in that about them. Be careful, saint of God. Make sure that we are not guilty of looking self-righteous rather than spiritual. That leads us to the other side of the contrast, and that is that this love rejoices in truth. This truth is based and rooted in God's Word. Love rejoices when truth is known and prevails in any life. You see, the heart of God is that every single person on planet earth would come to know his love and come to know his forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. The, the love and the heart of God that we read about in John three sixteen. the heart of the gospel is the heart of love that Paul is talking about here. And that heart desires for everyone to allow the truth of God to be rooted in that life and to prevail. That means that all of us would come to the place of spiritual maturity that all of us would look like Christ and reflect Christ, that all of us would live this life of love before a watching world. And so he says, on the contrast, rather than looking for the faults to tear them down, God is always on the side of wanting everyone to come to this place. We cannot claim to be spiritually mature people and play winners and losers in the church. That was a great place for an amen, but boy, did we go silent. Because God is not on the place of winners and losers. It's, it's not my side and your side, and it's not this group and that group. It is souls who were breathed into the living breath of God that Christ died for. And God wants the entire church to come to the place of maturity. And so he says here, please understand... Don't be that one like those in Corinth who are tearing down their brothers and sisters in order to say, look at me, I'm spiritual, because in so doing, all you're doing is declaring you're a self-righteous person, not a spiritual person. Love will always rejoice when others are recognized and promoted for living the truth. You see, this love doesn't know jealousy. This, this love doesn't have to tear others down because they are recognized for the good in their life. Dr. John MacArthur, commenting on this part of verse 6, said, Love appreciates the triumphs of ordinary folk. Our children are built up and strengthened when we encourage them in their accomplishments and in their obedience. Love does not rejoice in falsehood or wrong, but its primary business is to build up and not tear down, to strengthen and not weaken. How many of us, if we'd be real honest with the Spirit of God, would say, my primary objective in my prayer life is to build up others and ask God to strengthen them? How many of us would if we were really honest, if God were to pull back the veil of our private thoughts, it's thoughts for the good of everyone. How many of us, if God were to pull back the veil from some of our most private conversations, would there be conversations where it's heard? Man, I really want to see that person to succeed. I really want to thank God for what he's doing in that life. Or would it be she thinks she's all that. He thinks he's all that. I don't know why you fill in the blank. And isn't it interesting? Dr. MacArthur said, we get it as parents. 
we have to discipline our kids and part of that is yes we have to correct them but part of correcting is you can't just always tear them down you can't just always say that's wrong at some point you've got to say that's right way to do it there's got to be an encouragement in there and we get it with our kids but we don't get it with each other in our relationships And if you're always looking for the fault listen to me if you're always looking for the fault you'll find it because everyone in this room has faults so if you're always looking for the faults you'll find it but if you're always looking for the good you can find it too because God is at work in all of us Secondly, we move from love's great contrast to love's great consistency. And you find that in, in verse 7 where he talks about the all things. Love is consistent. So in these four areas, it's, it's these all things. And so you read that and it talks about bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So let's look at love's great consistency and we break down each one of those all things. So the first one is love bears all things. The Greek word there for bears all things is an interesting word, and you really need to, to hear it. It has a dual purpose. So this word means that love then does two things. One, it covers all things, and two, it bears up under all things. So, so watch. So to bear all things means that this love is going to hold up and it's going to cover at the same time now why is that important because here's what the Holy Spirit through Paul is saying as he describes this love that we as Christians ought to have and boy does it really test all of us who would say that I feel like that I'm maybe mature spiritually Paul is saying Love must stand under the weight and the onslaught against that love, but it also covers up the faults of others. Now, I didn't say it liked the faults of others. I, I don't mean that it never was willing to confront the faults of others, but it also has no pleasure in exposing the wrong and the weaknesses of others. Listen to what one theologian said about this verse. Love covers unworthy things rather than bringing them to the light and magnifying them based on 1 Peter 4, 8, which says that love covers a multitude of sins. It's willing to put up with everything. It's always eager to believe the best and to put the most favorable construction on ambiguous actions. So when he says that we're to bear things, thinks what he's saying is, he says, hey, if you hear something about someone, number one, even if it's ambiguous and you're not absolutely sure it's true, do you receive it as truth with joy because you're tickled that you've got a piece of gossip about someone? I mean, are you like a dog that just found a T-bone in the trash? Or do you step back and go, I'm going to believe the best about this person. To cover it doesn't mean to excuse the wrong. Here's what it means. I'm not going to pass the gossip chain down the track. I'm not going to run them down and talk to them. Number one, if it's true, then I want to see them become what God wants them to become. And number two, if it's false, I don't want to be guilty of the most pernicious form of rejoicing over other sin, gossip. I don't want to tear people down. I want to see them become what God wants them to be. And then, listen, love bears up under it. You're going to hold it up. That's not an easy thing to do. Let's be honest. We live in a culture, even in the church, where gossip is almost just seen as this, oh, well, it's not a big deal. And everybody likes to be involved in it. And if you don't get involved with the gossip train, then they start looking at you funny like you're something wrong with you. But real love says, no, 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 no. I don't care. I don't care, brother, if you don't like the fact that I'm not going to run with this. I don't care, sister, if you don't like that I'm not going to run with this. 
I'm called to love this brother. I'm called to love this sister. I'm called to love this person. I'm going to bear all things. And ultimately, we're all called to help them bear the burden of it. The Bible says, have you ever caught this before? You who are spiritual, restore those who are weak. Paul wrote that. Paul is telling you right now who the spiritual people are. You see, the one who's willing to come along beside the broken and the fallen are the ones who are willing to bear all things. Secondly, we see that he calls us to believe all things. That phrase means that love believes the best about a person. Love is not suspicious or cynical. Wouldn't it be great if we lived in a world that wasn't cynical? Now, here's the thing. The world is always going to be cynical because they're unspiritual. Y'all with me? But isn't it a sad condemnation that the spirit of cynicism runs through the church of Christ? Think about it. We're quick to think the worst about someone rather than the best. We're quick to receive bad news about people than good news about people. To believe all things means that we're going to believe the best about a person. John MacArthur put it this way. He says, when love throws its mantle over a wrong, it believes in the best outcome for the one who's done the wrong. Paul's not saying here that they aren't guilty of wrong. They may be guilty of wrong, but this love that covers a multitude of sins, we're going to choose to think the best of them, and we're going to believe the best outcome of them. And so Dr. MacArthur says, when this love is thrown over the wrong, it believes in the best outcome for the one who has done the wrong, that we believe that that wrong will be confessed, forgiven, and the loved one restored to righteousness. Therefore, love believes all things in this way. If there's a doubt about a person's guilt or motivation, love will always opt for the most favorable possibility. Isn't it amazing if there's just even a, a question that we'll always take it to the furthest, worst possibility? Well, I heard... Well, you know, I heard, well, you know, if that's true, then I bet. And if that's the case, then I bet. And before you know it, you're miles away from where you even started, and you shouldn't have even started where you started. In another place, that's called character assassination. Are we people under Christ who believes the best about people? Are we always looking for the faults of others? Are we always looking to pick? Are we always looking to tear down? Do we sit in our quietest thoughts and think the worst things about people? In our closest confidants, are our conversations, are they about the good of people, the hope that Christ has for their life? Or... Are our private conversations cynical? Thirdly, he moves to hopes all things. This means that love never ceases to hope. It never loses its hope. Love is hopeful that those who have failed will not fail again. They don't want to believe that the failure is inevitable and that it will keep on going Rather, the child of God has hope that God is at work in that life, that even if they have failed, if they have wrong, that the wrong won't continue. How many of us become cynical that even when those who have failed us, those who have sinned against us, and you say, well, you know, they, they, they wronged me, and we write them off. What if God had wrote us off all the times we've blown it against him? By the way, every one of us in this room would be written off. Every one of us. 
Paul is saying here is that this kind of love never loses hope. I think Peter was about to lose hope. He said, you know, what, what if somebody sins this many times against me and, and this many times in the day they come back? And Jesus said, Peter, 70 times 7, man, you still forgive. Because you always hope, not in the person. Listen, your hope's not in the person. Your hope is in the work of God and that God is at work in their life and that if they have fallen and failed, that God is not allowing the enemy to have the final say of defeat over their life. And you, as one who is spiritual, who knows the love of Christ, you're there to pick them up, to speak encouragement and correction and to speak direction into their life because you love them and you want to see them succeed to become all all that Christ wants them to be and in the process you keep hoping God's at work God's at work God's at work yes, Dr. William Barclay on this phrase hope all things says this love expects that good will eventually triumph and gain the victory. It refuses to accept failure. It always hopes for the best and for the ultimate triumph of the good, no matter, listen, no matter how fallen or how tragic the fall is or how difficult gaining the victory may seem. How many of us go, he's hopeless? She's a lost cause. They're never going to get it. They're never going to grow up. They're never going to. They're never going to get past that. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not the heart of God. This agape love never gives up. The heart of God continues to pursue people. The heart of God continues to work with people where they are to take them where He wants them to go. The heart of God continues to work in those situations that He might get the glory out of that life. And so therefore, this hope all things is a hope founded in the goodness of God, in the mercy of God, in the grace of God, founded in the person of God, founded in the consistent pursuit suit of God, founded in this love of God that will not let people go even when we do. How many times have you watched the parent of a wayward child hope in all things? They'll grab a hold and they'll keep hoping in God. God pursuer. God, rescue him. God, return him. And you've seen parents hold on to that hope until their dying breath. Paul says that's not just for parents of wayward children. That's for all of us. As people in Christ. That's what he's talking about. That's the picture. And then finally, he says, endures all things. The Greek word there for endure is hupomene. It's a military term. It means to stand. Basically, the army would be told, this ground is too important to lose. It's too vital of a position. Strategically to the battle, it cannot be lost. Therefore, you must hupomine, you must hold it, you must endure whatever you have to endure, but don't give up ground. What Paul is basically telling us is that this position of agape love that he's just described, ladies and gentlemen, it's the essence of Christianity. And he says, this ground is too important to give up to the enemy. That's why when you go back to the beginning when we talked about the most pernicious form of rejoicing over other sin is gossip. This is why it's so pernicious. Because the moment that we begin to do that, we give up the ground of Christian love for every single soul that was created by God. 
You've given up the high ground. You've given the enemy the foundation. The Christian that's lost love. has lost the ability to be a witness in this world. Until they repent and come back to love. The church that loses love no longer reflects Christ, but now reflects Phariseeism. No longer promotes grace, but promotes self-work and self-righteousness. To give up this ground is to give up everything we're based on. For God so loved the world. He took the ground. I love them. Satan laughed and said, they've rebelled against you. They've denied you. They despise you. They want nothing to do with you. They could care less about you. And God said, I love them. This is the ground. And when Christ came and they nailed him on the cross and they lifted that cross up, Christ said, I'm holding this ground. You can take my life. You can crucify me, but I'm holding this ground. I love them. And when he died and he ascended to the pit, ladies and gentlemen, and all of hell rejoiced. And they said, give it up. And he said, oh no. I will not give up. I'm not giving up this ground. I died for them and I loved them. And Satan said, it won't do you any good. You're dead. And three days later, the father said, I'm holding this ground. Arise, my love. And when the sun came out of the ground, he said, I love them. That ground is precious ground, church. It's blood bought ground. It's been defended through the ages by the Father himself. And the church that represents the Father has to hold that ground at all cost. Now, what does that mean? That means no matter how much they hurt you, hold that ground and love them. You see, Satan's greatest attack is to cause us to give up love. Satan will whisper, they don't care about you. They're against you. They're not for you. We start thinking the worst about them. Then we start gossiping about them. We begin to tear them down in our own minds and our hearts because to tear them down puffs us up. And we begin to walk into self-righteousness rather than in spirituality. And when we begin to do that, we're giving up the ground. And we've lost the witness. And it doesn't matter what your gift is. This is what Paul's saying. Listen to me. I don't care what your gift is. I don't care how showy it is. I don't care how many people tell you you're spiritual because of your gift. He says, if you've given up that ground, you're not spiritual. Endure all things. Love actively fights and endures every attack. It struggles against any and every assault to cave in to being unloving rather than loving. Finally, I want you to notice love's great commitment. Verse 8, the first part, he concludes this part of his discussion. And he says, love never fails. The Greek word is a it's a word picture, and it's talking about a flower. And it's talking about how a flower begins to wither and die, and then the petals or leaves will fall to the ground. And Paul says, you've watched the beauty of flowers die. My wife's birthday was January the 30th. And uh, I bought her roses, and they're sitting on the kitchen counter, and boy, you know, when they're delivered, you're so proud. You know, Rusty, you know, you walk in, and you hey, look what came for you, and there's this beautiful bouquet of roses, and they're so red and so green, and, so, and they're just beautiful, and, you know, and then your wife says, oh, they're gorgeous, and they sit them there, you know, and then you, you baby them for days. You put the stuff in them. They tell you to put in, to put the water, but you know what? Those suckers are going to die. And when I left the house this morning, they're still sitting there on the counter, and they've all went, 
and they were still in the water, and they, they're dead, and the beauty's gone. But the beauty and the nature of the love of God will never wither. Doesn't matter if I give up that ground or you give up that ground, he's not giving up that ground. And it will never wither away, never die, never fail. Would you bow your heads? So, Father, right now I pray that you would speak into the heart of every one of us in this room. Lord God, I pray right now for every man, woman, boy, and girl that's in this place that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And Lord God, I'm, I'm asking you right now, God, that you would speak in the depth of their soul by the power of your Spirit. God, if they don't know Christ as their Savior, Lord, that they would get up out of their seat in just a moment when we begin to sing this song of invitation and they would come grab one of our pastors by the hand and say, I need to know Jesus as my Savior and Lord and allow them to show them from the Word of God how they can be saved. Father, I beg you, don't let them walk out of this place today, Lord. Don't let them walk out of this place today. Still not saved, still not a child of God, still not sure that heaven is their eternal destination if they were to leave this world. Now, Father, I also pray for the saints of God in this room, all of us here. God, that we would allow the Spirit of God to speak deeply into our hearts and to shine a light in our, our heart, in our motives, in our thoughts, in our attitudes, in our actions, and test us when it comes to love, Lord. God, are we giving up the ground? Are we quick to gossip and to tear down? Or are we quick to build up, come alongside and encourage those who've stumbled and fallen? Are we quick to think the worst, be cynical, to tear down? Are we quick to think the best? To seek, Lord, to cover it all with love and allow you to work. Have we given up on people and written them off? Help us to be people who hope in all things that God is still at work. Lord, Right now, whatever it takes, you be glorified in all of our lives. And may we, may we be real with the Spirit of God this morning in Jesus' name.